Hey everyone, welcome back to the What Is Money show. I am sitting down again today with Mr. Jeff Snyder, and we're going to continue our journey into this rabbit hole of central banking uh, in the global financial system more broadly. And I think we left off, Jeff, on what you've called GFC2, which was the early uh, 2020 liquidity crisis. Um, what I guess we could start there. Just what it seems like every time we go through one of these events, we learn something. I don't know if it's something actually useful or, you know, perhaps central bankers are getting false feedback on this particular approach working this time. They think it'll work again. So, what kind of pain points led us into the March 2020 liquidity crisis? And what, if anything, did we learn as a result? Well, I'm not sure. It depends on who you mean when you refer to as we. I'm thinking you're right. policy makers. Yeah. Policy makers don't appear able to learn much at all. In fact, <laughs> March 2020, which was most severe dollar shortage we've had since 2008, wasn't actually the only one we've had since 2008. There have been multiple periods of dollar shortages, which you know, which led to, for example, QE2 in 2010 and 2011, QE3 and QE4 in the United States in 2012, you know, multiple QEs in Europe. They're on QE25 and 26 in Japan. So the ability for central bankers to learn, hey, this QE stuff, this bank reserves, it doesn't appear to be working. Let's try something out. I don't think that's there. I think it's really about how do we maintain the status quo how do we justify our monetary existence as a not central bank central bank, which is really about placating the public, giving mm -hmm. the public something to hang their hat on so they can sentimentally be positive about what the central bank is doing, whether or not it has any actual monetary or economic impact. Because it's very easy to say, look at all these bank reserves, look at all the, look at all the assets we're buying. It has to be doing something positive. And even if you don't know exactly what it is we're doing, don't question it because it's beyond your pay grade, right? This is something mm. for us to consider as central bankers and policymakers because we're really smart. We have we have complex mathematical models, so just just go along with us and just let us let us dazzle you with our QEs that just don't seem to work. And so it puts the public to sleep every couple of years when we go through this because people think, well. You know, every time this QE happens, we the, all the news media tells us that they're pouring trillions of dollars into the real economy. And who am I to argue otherwise? Even though it doesn't seem like it really works, I don't know how to I don't know how to consider what they're actually doing. And policymakers, of course, don't have any incentive to actually change because they're not rewarded by success or failure. They're war, rewarded by perception of what they do, which is completely something completely different. Uh. Great point. So this, first of all, the way you describe that sounds like the utmost arrogance and self-deception. It's like, don't worry about it, what it I'm is. doing. Just trust me, my mathematics. You know, it, 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 it is. And again, and I think we talked about this before. There's a mm -hmm. reason why it came to be this way, which is that the central banks a long, long time ago discovered they could no longer do money, which is mm -hmm. really what a central bank should be doing. And in lieu of being able to define, let alone measure, you know, measure, let alone define money, what do you do? Well, you pretend that you still do money and try to mm. fool people into manipulating, you know, by manipulating their behavior. And this is really just an extension of that. We're trying to get people to believe we're doing something inflationary so that they act inflationary. Therefore, they create inflation through what mm. is really a fairy tale or smoke and mirrors, or however you want to call it. I call it a puppet show because it's yeah. just about as inspiring as one. So they, they do things that people are not supposed to question. And so long as you accept that QE is money printing, they believe it doesn't matter if it actually is money printing because you'll act on that belief. And therefore it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, which wow. is in, if you think about it, completely upside down, especially in a situation where you have a real monetary problem that you can't fix with a puppet show. You, you gotta mm -hmm. fix with some real money but the Federal Reserve or the GCB or the Bank of Japan don't have any real money to give. Therefore, what is their only other option? To repeat this puppet show time and time and time again and hope that one of these times, even just random good luck, everything just goes right. But of course, that's never going to happen, which is why they just they continue to repeat QEs and bank reserves and everything else. And it never leads us into the right situation, 
we keep repeating these global dollar shortages every couple of years because nothing has really changed. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of getting back to the earlier point where central banks have in a way been demoted from you know the dean of dollar university to the janitor where they're just trying to play <laughs> yeah, cleanup. Exactly. Um, so let me ask you this, does it, is real economic growth necessary to keep this QE charade going? And, and, and your, your point is not lost to me, by the way, that they've kind of gotten to, into the business of managing expectations, which if you have inflation expectations, that creates inflationary behavior in a way, right? Like people spend and borrow more and all these things. So there's this, there's that self-fulfilling prophecy element to it. But what, what I was saying is if you were in a world of just hypothetically zero economic growth, then they're just reallocating capital at that point, right? It's whoever's getting the new money first is getting more uh, call options on goods and services than the people that are getting it last. So is, is real economic growth feeding this charade and enabling it to go on? No, it's the lack of economic growth that creates the need for the charade. And it's the charade which inevitably fails but then the lack of you know more public confusion about what's really going on so that they can maintain the charade a lot longer because we don't connect the dots between deflationary monetary conditions depression in real in the real economy especially the labor market and what the federal reserve does which we see and understand or at least we're told to understand which is liquidity it's pouring trillions of dollars into the real economy that's what we hear time and time again whenever one of these qes is implemented uniformly across every single mainstream financial media source that's what you'll hear the fed is printing money and putting in the real economy in the fed's biggest critics what do they say they, they say the fed is doing too much money printing hardly anybody out there argues no the fed doesn't print money at all it's not a central bank at all and so the public can't keep can't connect all of these which are really easy dots to connect and that's why the charade continues on and on because everybody knows something's wrong here whether it's through the lens of inequality or you know lack of inflation lack of this inflation puzzle the fact the dollar won't crash despite every proclamation that it's going to whatever it whatever it is that continuously fails we can never connect those dots because we see the Fed expanding its balance sheet, we see the Fed's bank reserve going way up, and we're conditioned to believe that's all, that's base money, that's all the money that matters, and therefore the Fed is printing money, but yet it's not becoming inflation, the economy's not growing, so that's gonna lead the Fed to print more money. But yet, when you step out of that, step out of that worldview and look at it from the perspective of, they don't actually print money, they just create bank reserves, and bank reserves are not money, then you can see the game for what it actually is. It's all about psychological manipulation. And you know these bank reserves aren't even functional liquidity in a market sense either. They're really just an accounting fiction that's really designed for the Federal Reserve to manipulate your expectations at the zero lower bound. Because mm -hmm. really monetary policy is supposed to be about raising and lowering interest rates, which is another kind of, of smoke and mirrors as well. So. It all really is about manipulating expectations rather than being effective money. And then you realize the symptoms of the last 14 years are all consistent with the lack of effective money in the global economy. That's when you put all these pieces together and, and uh, realize what's going on here. Hmm. Interesting. So, okay, lack of economic growth then is the impetus for the charade, but isn't the charade itself also dissipative to economic growth? I mean, all these distortions in the marketplace, they have to be causing misallocation of capital to some extent. So that's got to have feedback Q into Q less economic it's, growth. It's not really QE that's causing it though. QE is masking the problem, which means we don't fix it. Now it does cause some distortions because these, these psychological effects, for example, they are really, really good at manipulating stock prices. Stocks mm -hmm. go up whenever the Fed is confident because everybody in the financial services industry wants to buy stocks. And if Jay Powell is doing QE, they call up their clients and say, let's buy stocks because the Fed's printing money. Right. So the stock market is easily manipulated. Now, that's not a huge deal, but it does distort, uh, as you were saying, capital allocations, especially mm -hmm. when companies are rewarding the stock market uh, trend by yeah. reinvesting and buying back shares rather than their own company. So that's but that's even a liquidity preference itself. But I think the biggest misallocation of resources is the deflationary aspect of low interest rates on safe and liquid instruments, treasuries, uh, German bonds, JGBs. 
That's not the Fed lowering interest rates. It's deflationary environment lowering interest rates, which has allowed governments around the world to ride the coattails of, of tight money and therefore low interest rates to basically finance ridiculous deficits, which as we know, and I think you agree with me, Robert, that government spending, especially this, this level of government spending is incredibly wasteful, incredibly mm -hmm. inefficient, and an incredibly negative and negative self-reinforcing kind of, of depressing type of situation. So, you know, the, the worse we get into deflation that QE doesn't fix, the lower interest rates go, which then preference government government borrowing for reasons that have nothing to do with government borrowing or credit risk, mm -hmm. which then just makes the situation worse because now banks are allocating all their balance sheet space to safe and liquid assets, which is being used in the real economy for all the wrong types of things. Right. And it just it's that's how you end up with Japan because you have deflation, constant deflation, you have ridiculous QEs, and then that leads to governments trying to solve the problem with in ways they're ill-equipped to solve. Wow. And it just becomes a self-reinforcing spiral. Yeah, I could definitely see the vicious cyclical nature of this. Um, I mean, my current view is, I guess, is as extreme as it can be. I actually think every dollar a government spends is a misallocation of capital because they're withdrawing yeah. <laughs> factors from what the free market would select and deploying right. it towards some politically determined aim. Especially um, if the banking system is the one financing it through buying treasuries mm. that they should be, you know, the banks should be lending to mom and pop businesses, for example, because that's mm. really who gets left out in this deflationary environment because the banking system preferences the only safe and liquid assets, which loans are right. not safe, nor are they liquid. Yeah. And so we're channeling scarce monetary and financial resources through the largest governments, which, as you pointed out, is, you know, even if it was wasn't as bad as you say, it's never going to be as good as it would be had the banking system lent into the free market through intermediating actual monetary needs, you know, the, the meeting the supply and demand for money and credit. It's there's there's no way government is better than the other way. But yet, because of the deflationary environment, because QE isn't money printing, that's the way that the that in certainly at these margins, there's real economies all over the world are are funneling more resources through governments than they otherwise would have, which just makes the problem worse. And therefore it guarantees more deflation, more lack of economic growth, and therefore more government spending down the road because mm -hmm. the governments continuously try to get out of it through using the neo-Keynesian textbook. Mm. So, I mean, what we're describing here is a tilting of the game board then towards the, the largest institutions, right? The, the, I guess the institutions that need the liquidity least have easiest and cheapest access to it. And it's, it's crowding out mom and pop as you're describing. So in terms of credit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because that's really what's happened. And you see this repeatedly during deflationary periods or depressionary periods. You know, I just wrote an article today about it in the 1930s, where you look at where bank lending went, uh, it collapsed by more than 50% between 29 and 33, and then never came back. And even though banking assets started to come back in the late, in the middle and late 30s, they came back because banks were buying U.S. Treasuries by the mm -hmm. bushelful. They financed mm -hmm. the great the New Deal because they wanted safe and liquid. Because mm -hmm. the monetary system, the banking system, was broken in 1929. It wasn't a one-off thing. It was a systemic rupture, mm -hmm. and that's really what happened in 2008 too. And we can see it in the exact same fashion. You look at banks and their allocation to lending, and guess what? There in, in the, I think it was the fourth quarter of 2008, bank lending was about 60% of total uh, depository institution assets. In the last couple quarters of this year, it's less than 50%. Hmm. Banks don't lend anymore because they're buying, guess what? U.S. Treasuries and GSE debt. They're buying right. it by the bushel full right, because right. they want safety and liquidity. And not only are they buying it, they're paying more and more and more for the safety and liquidity, which is that that's why interest rates get depressed more and more and more not because of the Federal Reserve, not because of monetary policy, but because of the bank preference for safe and liquid assets, which is the interest rate fallacy explained. Right, okay. So tilting the game board towards bidding up these safe and liquid assets, which are the debt or equities of the largest institutions, this has to be contributing to wealth disparity, I would assume, I mean. Oh, tremendously. That's really, you know, the, this focus on equality, especially from left-wing politicians, is 
you know, there's a good basis for it. There's a fundamental explanation for it. It's just not what everybody says. Yeah. Everybody looks at the Fed and says they're printing money and it's all going to uh, it's all going to the wealthy. Well, what's really happening is I just said the stock market goes up, which mo mostly uh, mostly uh, increases the wealth or at least the paper wealth of wealthy persons, yeah. leaving everybody else out in the cold. Where the real inequality comes in is as stocks go up and paper wealth goes up in terms of wealthy people, real economic growth lags, which means people aren't working. And as people aren't working, the bottom tiers of society lag further and further and further behind mm. to the point where the disparity between the stock price of paper wealth and the income potential at the bottom at the bottom of the economy are so completely different. It's like you're looking at a different world which then leads to all of these political and social consequences where people go, the system is rigged. We don't really mm. know what's wrong, but it's, it's, we know it's wrong. It's, right. it's not getting any better. Therefore, why not try socialism? Because if this is capitalism and it's booming, we're not seeing any of that. So right. let's try something different anyway. But and that's really where inequality comes from. It comes from the lack of economic growth because of the depression, depressionary and deflationary monetary conditions that are holding everything back. And it's not just the US. Let's be clear here. This is a phenomenon that you see time and again all over the world yes. because this is a global reserve currency system. Therefore, its depressionary effects are spread out globally. Yeah. And it, ironically, the Chinese are the ones that are, that are going most towards socialism because they've realized there's no escape from the system. So they're, they've ditched their capitalist phase and they're going back into a Maoist phase again because What's the point? There's no economic growth to be had here. Wow. So, I mean, it's deceptive once again, because you have people upset thinking this is capitalism, but it's in fact the lack of capitalism to some extent. I mean, a lot of these policy measures, they're not capitalistic at all. They're even anti-capitalistic, right? Anti-competitive and whatnot. So, yeah, and it, look, you go back to 2008, the capitalist free market solution would have been let the system kind of get worse yeah. so that it would clear out all the bad parts of it. Instead, the QEs were designed to maintain the status quo with the hope that by manipulating psychology, everything would go back to normal. That's really what QE was, this is placating you know, the upset public and financial markets into believing that don't worry about it. We've printed a bunch of money. Therefore, things will go back to normal in, in, in a short period of time. It really was just about buying time and manipulating emotion so that the, the contraction or the crisis would end and then recovery would take hold and then everything would go back to normal. But if you're looking at the system the way it actually is, you realize that that wasn't going to happen because 2008 was a systemic rupture or permanent rupture. And therefore, there was no recovery potential. So what's the point of trying to buy time when you don't have any more time because everything has changed. And that's, you know, that's where you get into inequality again and everything else, because it's really about banks, not central banks. And that's that's really the hardest thing to overcome intellectually. That's the biggest intellectual leap to make, mm -hmm. because, again, everything we're taught, everything we're, we're told in the financial media, everybody says the Fed prints money. And it, it, it's hard to get around the fact that that might not even be true. Mm -hmm. OK, so. This is a grand game of expectation and manipulation and psychological manipulation. It is driving wealth inequality, which it seems to me that the political polarization is just symptomatic of, right? People, the wealth, the middle class, I guess, to use the proverbial term, is just getting destroyed. And that's reflected in our political discourse. Right. And, you, and there's no answers, right? Because nobody has an answer for what's wrong because, you know, first of all, most central bankers and politicians, politicians who get their economic commentary from central bankers, they tell you everything's fine. What do you mean something's wrong? Everything's great. Haven't you seen the unemployment rate in the US? It's it's 50 year low. Mm. Never mind the participation problem, which, as you said, yeah. is the devastation of the middle class. So without any answers from the quote unquote establishment, People quite naturally turn to extremes because mm -hmm. there are people who claim to have answers. And you know what? You know, it seems like these are plausible answers because I'm not getting anything from 
Um, you know, I'm not getting for anything from the Fed. I'm not getting anything from Congress. I'm not getting anything from whatever president or whatever political party. This is a bipartisan political failure, and it is really an establishment failure, mm. which is why populism has become, you know, like it was in the 30s, a rising force on both sides, whether it be right or left, simply because nobody has any answers for what's going wrong. But people know there's something wrong. They know right. that this is not working. Yeah. It I mean, it seems to me like this deception is just snowballing, right? Even it, regardless of intentionality, I'm not saying that the central banks are the wizard behind the curtain that set out to deceive people, but even if it's their own self-deception, then propagating out into the real world, creating real impact, right? Real wealth disparity, changing real political discourse, leading to real populism. I mean, this, it really is... <laughs> a big complex of lies. Yeah, and it's hard to break out of it. it. You know, from the perspective of a central banker, number one, because it's an expectations-based policy, you can never admit that you're wrong. You have to maintain this illusion that you're in charge because as soon wow. as you admit, oh, maybe I'm not in charge, then people stop believing in the fairy tale, right? Right. As soon as you admit, well, maybe bank reserves aren't money, then people will no longer act as if it is. Therefore, the inflation expectation game all falls apart. Wow. So they can never come clean and say, you know what? We told you QE was this powerful money printing. Guess what? It's not. They can never say that. And by, you know, even worse than that, people would then naturally say, well, what the hell were you doing during 2008 while the world was falling apart? Right. You were playing this game with money and bank reserves that wasn't real money and bank. You know, it was only bank reserves. So you basically left the entire global economy out in the cold to suffer the consequences of the worst, you know, financial crisis since the Great Depression. Yeah. And no more than that, when you start to look at it, in the overall whole, it's been this way for half a century. So you have to say, what the hell were you central bankers doing for five decades when you couldn't define and measure money? But yet you, you let people believe that you were this centralized monetary agency, this ideal technocratic agency that knew everything there was to know about money when the, tr when the truth was the exact opposite. You had no idea what was going on in the monetary system, which, by the way, is proven when you look at any DSGE model from you know, mainstream economics. There's no input for money in it at all. Mm -hmm. they, the economists run their monetary regime based on this expectations, assumptions that the expectations policy is effective because they have no idea how to even model the monetary system. And I know, look, it sounds like it's conspiracy wow. theory. It sounds like a gigantic conspiracy well, theory. In some ways it is, except that, you know, it's one of those things where you start down this road toward expectations policy. How do you get off of it? Right. And remember also for, for a long time there, between the 1980s, 1990s, and the middle 2000s, it really did seem like it was working and it did seem like it was working really, really well. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of academic scholarship and reverse engineering that says, you know, we, we know we're lying. We know this is smoke and mirrors. And by the way, there's, there's lots of academic scholarship and lots of, of incidents where you can see that central bankers admit this is all a lie. We don't do money. Mm -hmm. I have tons of quotes from them where they admit we don't do money, but you know, for 25, 25 years there, it thought, this stuff really does work. So there's wow. nothing. I mean, it's we're lying to people for their own good and it's effective. And then that, that just all fell apart in August of 2007. And how do you go back to, you know, how do you go with a different direction from that point? Instead, it's just we'll do QE, hope that works. Well, that didn't work. Let's do another QE. We'll hope that works because we can't admit the other two didn't work. And maybe we'll do another one. You just get locked. You paint yourself into such a narrow corner there's really no way out without just saying we got to start from scratch. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, regardless of whether you categorize it as a, a conspiracy theory or not, it is definitely a psychological operation. I mean, this is all about psychology. It's a confidence game in a way. Right. And if one of the most successful in history, <laughs> yeah. you have, so you do have to tip your hat to the fed and all these central banks for that, because even now, so many years after the financial crisis, people still think it was about subprime mortgages, and they still think QE's money printing, and they still think the they still think the Fed is a central bank, and that it's an even as an effective central bank when none of those right. things are true. Oh my goodness! And then, I mean, I love the point you make where they can't even exhibit humility. Central bankers cannot exhibit humility because 
Well, first of all, humility necessary for learning, right? You can't possibly learn anything if you're not humble. But humility in this case would destroy the deceptive social construct or confidence game that this thing has become. So it's like not only are they not learning, but they can't even be willing to learn or they'll destroy the thing. You know, and it's, it's weird because there's all sorts of it's you're, that's exactly right, Robert. And there's all sorts of weird uh, manifestations of that. For example, the Japanese pioneered quantitative easing all the way back in March of 2001. So 20 years ago, they started experimenting with a quantitative easing. And by 2002, 2003, everybody knew it didn't work. Mm -hmm. What I mean, everybody, I mean, everybody in the central banking community, and those people who paid attention, they knew it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And yet in June of 2003, the FOMC held a discussion about quantitative easing because, you know, at that time, there were, Greenspan was lowering interest rates and they got them in sight of the zero lower bound. And they were, they were facing the first potential use of quantitative easing in the United States. And what they said was Japanese QE clearly does not work. It's not having the intended effects we all thought it would. So what's wrong here? And what they decided on was that no, Kiwi works. It's just the Japanese used it in the wrong way. Mm. And that's you know, self-deception mm -hmm. there. It's like, how can we explain Kiwi didn't work, but still hold on to the idea behind Kiwi? And that's what they really decided. And it's, it's amazing when you read through this discussion, it's the, the amount of self-deception and delusion involved in that is just astounding. So right. they know Kiwi doesn't work, but they have all these different ways of explaining well, it must work. It just maybe this one thing wasn't right about it, or maybe it was the Japanese fault and we'll do it right when we get a chance to do it. And that's really, you see this all the time through economics, the self-delusion. The biggest one probably is the, the as we just said, the participation problem in the labor market. Yeah. For years there, including now, economists at the central banks have tried to delude themselves into believing that, well, no, it's not that QE doesn't work. It's that Americans are too lazy. They won't go back to school or they, you know, they're, they're addicted to drugs. And so they're blaming you and me. They're blaming you and me for the lack of economic growth and the decimation in the labor market and the participation problem. Because if they realize and understand that what's really going on here is macro slack and ineffective money monetary policy, then it all falls apart. They, mm. have, to, they have to reverse engineer some explanation that maintains the <clears throat> illusion that everything is as they think it, it should be. And it's, 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 it's amazing how much that this goes on in both public as well as private channels. And I think some of the private channels are, are just, they just blow your mind how they say this doesn't work, but then they come to the conclusion that it must work. Wow. It's, you pile up the evidence, you know, interest rates, again, you know, uh, the interest rate fallacy, things like that. Tight money and all the symptoms of tight money, yet QE must still work because... Otherwise, what are we going to do around here? <sighs> okay. <laughs> so clearly, central bank. Or so, you know, just, that's that's why I say you don't have to take my word for it because I know it sounds like a conspiracy theory. I urge people to read these transcripts. I urge people to read the research that's produced by these central banks that show conclusively QE doesn't work, and therefore it's not as big as an intellectual leap to make to understand. They're not central banks. They don't print money. They do other things because right. all the scholarship is there. You don't have to take my word for it. It's there. They produce it. All you have to do is just open your mind a little bit to thinking the monetary system is not what we're, we've told, what we've been told. And that when you realize that all these things start to fall into place about why things are happening and why they never get, they never seem to go the right way. Hey, everybody. As you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. Led by Robbie Gutman, Yen Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So, whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services 
or a company looking to white label your own Bitcoin product or service, consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. Okay, so I'm trying to cut to the heart of the incentive structure here. Clearly, central banks and other policymakers or bureaucrats have an incentive to keep their job. That's pretty obvious. So that would make sense that even if the research says QE doesn't work, it's like they don't have any other option, right? They're just trying to, I guess, engage in the lesser of two evils, perhaps. They see the world burning down on one end or more QE slash kicking the can down the road on the other. They just choose the path of least resistance. What other incentives are being served here? I mean, like, are we are they protecting shareholder interest in the central bank to just keep this charade going? Or what's the cause for continuing the down the the deceptive path? Well, I don't think it's anything nefarious. And let's I mean, we're not we're not running against some gigantic Fed conspiracy where they're trying to crash the system to, you know, to pay off their Wall Street overlords or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Most of these central bankers are genuinely interested in finding solutions. They just don't have the worldview or they don't know how to do it. There mm -hmm. really are. And you're right. The incentive structure is. Not, it's not just that these are important jobs, but they're glamorously important jobs. Right. If you work at a central bank, you're given a privileged position in society. You're somebody we look up to. Yeah. You know, Janet Yellen gets paid $200,000 a speech, even though her tenure was marked by nothing but failure because of the job she held. And it's not, it's the same way for people at lesser staff positions in the Fed too, because you work at FRBNY for a while, you could probably get a good job in anywhere in Wall Street because that's on your resume. Mm -hmm. And so you have an incentive for defending the status quo because you're a part of it. Not only are you a part of it, you're in the best part of it. Mm -hmm. You have a prestigious job that everybody looks up to. You're like one of the smart people. You're the best and the brightest and all these other things, whether you are or not. But really, you know, these are not evil people only looking out for their own self-interest they are genuinely interested in things that are going wrong. They just can't see their way around it. You know, I use the example of Aristotle because it was, uh, I forget who it was, who called Aristotle an idiot. You know, asked, is Aristotle one of the smartest people in human history? Was he really an idiot? Because if you look at the objective science behind Aristotelian theory, it was all wrong. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. He got everything wrong. But why, I mean, how can a smart guy like that who is interested in, try, in finding answers, how could he get everything wrong? And the answer is he didn't have the worldview to interpret in a, in a correct way this natural phenomenon. And that's simply the same thing as central bankers because they can't define money and they don't look at the monetary system. They don't have the worldview to therefore you know, properly interpret mm -hmm. and properly assign cause and effect in what they do. So they're mm -hmm. kind of they're they're kind of navigating blindly mm -hmm. and without necessarily realizing that how blind they really are, except by repeated failure, they don't ever falsify their own theories. And that's that's where you get into the humanity of it, because, you know, as economists are notorious for their econometric models, these stochastic models, supposedly of the economy, they mm -hmm. fail time and time again. Yet rather than throw out these models. They just go back to them. They just go back to them over and over again, despite how many times they fail, because they treat them like they're their own children. And right. That's you know, again, that's a human human impulse. I mean, if somebody comes up to you and says your entire life's work has been wasted, how are you going to respond to that? Right. You're going to respond to that? no. You're, you're that's great. I have not you wasted go. my entire life doing this. There must be something redeemable in what I'm doing. So I'm going to hold on to that idea as long as I can. Mm. That's kind of the situation you get to here where the combination of all these things, you're in a prestigious job and somebody tells you you've wasted your life at that job. It's, it's not something you're going to just accept. You're going to continue to plot along inside that worldview as much as you can. You know, even if you do have that nagging feeling that, oh, that might be the right, that might be the right thing. Yeah. Oh, I really like this analogy to Aristotle, actually, because his worldview was largely limited by the technological realities of his time, right? Had he had Ooh. a microscope or a telescope or, uh, you know, calculus. Know, yeah, or, or <laughs> he had it, Newton's calculus, particle accelerator, it. you know, he right. probably would have uh, agreed with a lot of the modern worldview, let's say, or maybe even expanded upon it. So is that what's going on? That central bankers are just operating with this technologically outdated model of reality and they're just feeding it uh, and trying to keep it alive? 
they're trying to keep alive their place, what they think is their place in it, which is a prestigious place in what the public perceives as the, the operation of the system. Mm -hmm. But that's not the reality of the system. As you just have said before, not long ago, you know, it's, you know, central banks sort of sat there in the non-money non -money part of it doing expectations while the actual monetary system, these global banks kind of built up their own capacities around the central bank and kind of ignored it. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's really what the euro dollar system was, was essentially this offshore outside of regulation left alone to its own devices. And it really built up all these forms of liquidity, money, credit, and, you know, blurring the lines between money and credit that just had no place for the Fed. Right. The Fed moved around the, you know, federal funds right here and there. And the banking system sort of like shrugged its shoulders and did whatever it did anyway. Yeah. So, but, you know, because that's so different from public perception, you know, there's there's really no incentive for central banks to really take a hard look at themselves and realize the mountain of evidence here, which has falsified everything we thought about money and this expectations yeah. policy and how it's supposed to work. There's no way to reconcile that with all these other very human emotions and human responses. You know, I'm reminded here of something you said previously, where <laughs> because economic history is essentially unfalsifiable. Right. They can always yeah. just say, well, it would have been worse had we not right. done this. So there's no you can never call their bluff. And that's that's the other part of the human nature here, because that's what they're saying. You know, if you're saying you've wasted your life doing this, well, they, well, no, you know, because maybe it wasn't as effective as we thought, but it would have been worse if we hadn't had done this. Right. So there is some benefit to continuing this because and again, we can't falsify that. You're right. There's no mm -hmm. counterfactual to establish it. So that kind of keeps the emotional, you know, the emotional anchor to the game anyway going mm. because you can always say, well, if we don't do QE, it could get really bad or it could get a lot worse than it already is. So mm -hmm. maybe there is some benefit to continuing the game even, even further. So the non-empirical nature of economics to some extent is contributing to this as well because you just can never, there's nothing you can... There's no, like you said, there's no counterfactual. Basically, there's no one that can come out with a study saying, "Hey, everything they've done is completely wrong," uh, and this is empirically or rationally true. So, I mean, we're well, just you think that, but you know, the studies, they what they say is that QE didn't fail. We just can't, we can't identify the benefits. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, you know, I'm, 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 I'm uh, paraphrasing, but I'm yeah. not paraphrasing that much. Yeah. And, you know, the, the conclusions are various depending on the study, but it doesn't lower interest rates, which is the, the theorized channel. The market lowers interest rates, which is deflationary conditions. It doesn't create portfolio effects, which are uh, QE is, you know, I swap, uh, you, you're a bank and you have a bond. I buy that bond from you, give you bank reserves. That's not the end of the theory. The idea is that now that you have bank reserves, they don't, they don't earn much. So you're going to go out and lend because you, mm -hmm. you've given a bond that, that generates some return for bank reserves that don't. So your portfolio effect is when we do QE, I deprive you of an earning asset. You got to go replace it in the real economy. Mm -hmm. That never happens either. So strike two for QE. And then the third channel is the sentimental channel, which is supposed to have an effect through inflation expectations, but we never get inflation. So strike three there too. Hmm. And so that's where you get these studies that say, well, we can't identify the benefits of QE. So then we're going to go back to the counterfactual, which is, well, things might have been worse if we hadn't done it. So there must be some short run effect sentimental wise in, turn, in doing QE during crisis. And it's how do you say no? I mean, how right. do you say the, the system would have gotten better anyway had you never done QE because you can't ever prove it? So it's we don't know what it does, but we know it does something, even though we can't identify any benefits. <laughs> OK. Who are the central bank shareholders? Who owns the Federal Reserve? And are those well, shareholder I mean, interests being served in all of this self-deception? Yeah, but the, I mean, that's sort of a tricky area because, I mean, in one sense, I, I don't think it really matters all that much. But it's, the Federal Reserve system is a private institution that shareholders, you know, there's 12 different branches and the banks in those branches technically own the shares of the Fed. But it's not like we're distributing profits or anything else. And so really that comes down to is, are the Federal Reserve, you know, is the Federal Reserve, each of these 12 branch boards, are they working for their shareholders because they're appointed by their shareholders and therefore 
you know, are they doing some inside devious stuff to benefit banks who are simply exercising their shareholder rights to influence monetary policies? I don't think that's the case either, because, you know, ever since the 30s, most of the Federal Reserve's actions have been taken out of the branches and, and, and uh, centralized in the, federal, in the uh, federal Reserve Board or the Federal Open Market Committee. So it's less likely that the local branch shareholders are going to be able to influence the behavior of these economists at the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Open Market Committee. That being said, I mean, look, the, the Federal Reserve branch in, in the staff and the technical operations work hand in hand with the banks. They work hand in hand with Wall Street. So I mean, there's always going to be close contact between the Fed and the banking system. But, I mean, I'm sure that introduces all sorts of biases and other things like that, too. But I don't think it's, it's as clear cut as banks own the Fed, therefore they control the Fed. I don't think mm -hmm. that's the case at all. No, uh, yeah, I'm not trying to make the case that they control it necessarily. I'm just trying to parse through the incentive schema here. So are there dividends paid on, say, if you no. hold shares in any of the central bank, there's no dividends paid? Nope. It's the, the only rule, financial rule for the Fed, and this goes back to the original Federal Reserve Act in 1913, is that it can't cost taxpayers money. So it has right. to pay for its own operations, which, by the way, this is how open market operations were actually discovered by accident because the Fed had to start owning bonds in order to pay for, you know, generate a return to pay for its own expenses. So that's really the well, only financial rule here is that it is, can't cost taxpayers any money. I, I guess you would say it cannot explicitly or directly cost them money, but when you right. print money <laughs> to buy a government bond, you are benefiting from the, and from inflation, basically, right? Or well, assuming you actually printed money to buy the bond with. I mean, that's that's where we get into the uh, the other stuff. Well, maybe that's the wrong. Yes, they're term. absolutely costing the economy because of their smoke and mirrors game, yeah. which has left us in a deflationary condition, which has deprived the middle class of work and employment opportunities, which is why we have a participation problem. Yeah, and those to me, those are easy dots to connect. But in this in this current worldview that we're stuck with, the mainstream worldview, it's like completely different worlds, right? The Fed prints money, but yet we have all these deflationary consequences. Where are these coming from? Yeah. Okay. So no dividends paid. I think there was a dividend paid at some point. I don't know if they stopped doing that because um, there used to be a 6% dividend payable on uh, Federal Reserve shares. Did they stop doing that at some point? There were preference shares at one time, but I mean, that, that's the early Fed when it operated in a very different scheme. Um, you know, the reorganization in 1935 completely altered the landscape for good mm -hmm. reason, simply because the Fed was really bad at its job, which nothing has really changed in that regard. Mm -hmm. But at least the government then realized that maybe maybe we need to centralize uh, activities. Maybe we need to cut out some of these other things and make sure that the Fed is a public sort of almost utility type of institution. Mm. And whether or not it actually ever was, I mean, that was the intent and that was really the political right. goal in the in the reorganization of the, of the 1930s and the Great Depression was to make sure that it operated as sort of a public utility, which, I mean, outside of that, that period in the 80s and 90s under Greenspan, the Fed was treated as a joke through mo yeah. most of its history. Right. Uh, does it generate seniorage profits or what? How does seniorage fit into the picture? Does that go to the government, go to the central bank, or is it even in play? Well, if there's, I mean, obviously, now that its balance sheet has swelled, it, it takes in far more income than it pays out in its own expenses. So that money is just rebated back to the treasury, which then opens the door to claims of monetizing the debt and this shell game of, you know, hey, the, the, feds, or the feds receiving interest from the treasury on this treasury bond and then paying the excess interest back to the treasury department because it doesn't need the income to cover its expenses, which is sort of like this free game. Hmm. But that's, it's, that's just nothing new. I don't think people realize that, for example, and I think it was 2002, maybe 2003, back then the Federal Reserve owned 10% of outstanding treasuries even then. Uh. Um, this, again, because of its earning assets, because of its open market operations, it has always had a large portfolio of treasuries, but yet nobody in the early 2000s were accusing the Fed of monetizing the debt, right. or hardly anyone. Maybe there were some Ron Paul types out there doing that, but- the Fed has always had a large portion of the government debt, but not for 
you know, monetizing the debt reasons, but for its own purposes, which it thought was uh, uh, efficient and effective monetary policies. So I'm not convinced that's an incentive either, because this is the way it's been for a long time. Uh, okay, so man, I need to parse this definition then. Any time the treasury sells a bond to the Fed, that is monetizing the debt, doesn't it? But it doesn't sell the bond to the Fed. It can't. It has to go through the banking system first. Okay. Which so I mean, the, you can. There's the intermediate it's laundering. Step it's, yeah, it's an intermediate the commercial step. Bank, right? yeah. But the yeah, the, the economic substance is the same, right? Essentially, but you also have to, you know, not to trend, not to get into this counterfactual situation, but you also have to understand that maybe the banks would have bought the bond anyway, and it's not the Fed monetizing the debt. They're just taking the, the bond that the, the banking system wanted off their hands. Well, then it would become a real assessment of U.S. government creditworthiness at that point, right? <laughs> I actually think it's the liquidity risk because that's the reason why banks are owning safe and liquid assets because they, they don't care about the credit risk of the government. They care about the liquidity characteristics of the instrument, which is why time and time again, as we go through this QE shell game, banks, they sell these bonds to the Fed. The Fed expects them to do something risky, you know, the portfolio effects, and they just buy more of the treasury bonds. Right. So essentially, they're just, they want the liquid assets. They're happy to sell some of them to the, to the central bank, whether it's Japan, Europe, United States, or whatever. And so it's not really monetizing the debt. It's just moving and shuffling assets around back and forth. Huh. Yeah, and the net outcome is that more assets are owned by fewer people in the broader economy. <laughs> yeah. And there's less economic growth at the end of it all. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, all right, last question on this. Has there been an audit? I guess we'll just focus on the Fed because that's the big player here. Has there been an audit on the Fed to any extent? Ever? I doubt it. And I don't think there's a realistic one or I don't really see what, what the purpose would be. Hmm. We know what the Fed does. I mean, the Fed has committed itself to transparency somewhat. I mean, I mean, we know what the, I mean, you can go right now on FRBNY's website and it will tell you everything it's doing. Hmm. It can tell you what's in the reverse repo to the penny. It tells you everything that's in the SOMA holdings. It gives you all the results of its auctions, whether it be repo auctions or, you know, uh, QE auctions. It tells you everything you want to know. So I don't really see what the purpose of an audit is. Hmm. We know what the Feds does. What we don't know, what most public doesn't know, is what that actually means. It doesn't hmm. mean money printing. That's the problem. So auditing the Fed, I think, would actually be harmful because it would continue to foster this idea that the Fed is a central bank and it does all this money printing stuff. And that's really, again, my biggest complaint with the Fed's biggest critics is they all believe the Fed prints too much money. Mm -hmm. Nobody stops and says, what is it these guys actually do? And the funny thing is they tell you what they do. We just don't know how to interpret what they do properly because we're stuck in the Aristotelian worldview, which is the Fed is a central bank and it prints money. Mm -hmm. So we know what the Fed does. We know what its operations are, but we don't know how to classify or clarify what those operations are in the monetary context because we're taught to believe something that's not true. And what I always tell people is, look, it's not what the Fed does. It's what the commercial banking system does. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you see the Fed's balance sheet explode, because that could be quite, quite frankly, canceled out by all sorts of negative factors in, in the banking system that you never will see. Mm -hmm. So if the Fed's balance sheet explodes by a couple trillion, maybe that's balanced out or more by and likely is by contraction in the, in the global monetary system that you'll never be able to see except for how it, how it um, makes these certain markets behave. And that's really, it's hard to get your head around that the Fed doesn't matter because we see it's, it's trillions. We right. see there's trillions on its balance. We see all these bank reserves, but yet the behavior doesn't work out to be equivalent to money printing and inflation and all that stuff. It's exactly the opposite. 